Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, conference organized by the, uh, as part of the Kaleo seminar series of the European and Eurasian Studies program here at SAIS. My name is Alice Panier. I'm an assistant professor at the European Studies program. And I want to start uh, by thanking Christina Benitez, our uh, European Studies program manager, and Jessica Meyers, our uh, student program assistant, for putting together this event. It is my distinct uh, pleasure and an honor to welcome today uh, the Ambassador of France, uh, Philippe Etienne. Not only because I am myself uh, a French national, but also because since moving to DC in the summer 2017, I have come to realize that France is the European country of which we talk the most here in the US capital. And this is both because France is quote unquote the U more than Germany, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm biased, um, maybe I'm biased. But I think this is because um, France is quote unquote the US's oldest ally, uh, as this has even become a hashtag now, oldest ally. But also because France has historically and continues to play, uh, to speak with a powerful voice internationally on all matters pertaining to um, security, Europe and global challenges. And this is especially the case in this period of great uh, transformations for Europe and for Europe's uh, foreign policy. Enough about me. Uh, France, um, sorry, uh, the ambassador Etienne has most recently served as ambassador and permanent representative of France to the European Union from 2009 to 2014. That is to say, in a period where the EU was grappling with the effects of the financial crisis and the divisions uh, and the consequences on both the global economy and within Europe on European institutions and on the relations among European member states. He then served as ambassador to Berlin from 2014 to 2017 in a period where Germany was rethinking its international role and uh, coming uh, to the conclusion that it needed to uh, take more responsibilities internationally including in the field of security. And then finally, before arriving to DC in June 2019, Ambassador Etienne was the um, diplomatic advisor to President Macron as he took over the presidency and set out to start his uh, disruptive uh, agenda for both uh, Europe and the multilateral order. Uh, in a context where collective action at both the European level and the multilateral level were increasingly under challenge. So I cannot think of a better guest to talk about French foreign policy today in a transatlantic context, in a European context, and in a global context. So I will let the ambassador take the stage for a few short remarks. And the ambassador is willing and very, very happy to take uh, questions, to engage in a discussion with the audience. He will unfortunately have to leave before seven o'clock, right before seven o'clock. So uh, we will make our own conversation short and open the floor uh, quickly for your questions. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Ambassador. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I want to thank um, Professor Alice Panier. It's always a pleasure to find a compatriot working in such a prestigious university. Um, I'm delighted to be here because um, it's a pleasure for me to talk uh, about Europe from a French perspective. As uh, Alice said, my career has been mostly European. I'm a convinced European. I enjoy talking about Europe, but I think it is especially important to talk about Europe here in the United States. This is indeed not, in fact, not the first time I uh, have uh, been uh, able to, to select this topic for uh, an appearance in a American University, and um, I would like to to give you an, uh, 
in very brief introductory remarks my personal view of where we are in Europe right now and where and what it, what it, what uh, what is the importance actually of this European integration for the United States and for us collectively as democracies in the world which is changing so rapidly. Our president, Emmanuel Macron, said during his New Year's wishes to the, the French people uh, last uh, December, uh, he spoke about a, a European decade, about what we have to do in the 10 next years. Uh, we just had uh, European elections, elections to a new European Parliament. So we opened indeed a new page, and not only because of an unfortunate development, which is uh, Brexit, which is something we regret, but also because we have this new renewal of institutions and we have a new dynamism coming from these new institutions. I would just recall that 200 million voters in the EU's then 28 member states elected their members of the European Parliament in May. And interestingly, the voter turnout rate in these European elections last May was the highest in 20 years. With, uh, without this europhobic tidal wave which some people had announced. And after these elections, we, had, uh, we have put in place the new institutions, uh, including uh, in particular the new European Commission with a new president, a woman, a German politician, very much appreciated, Ursula von der Leyen, the first woman to hold this, that position, and a full college of commissioners, which was elected by the European Parliament on November 27. So we are now ready to go as the, this renewed European Union. And the president of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has presented her political roadmap after extensive discussions with the European leaders, with the heads of state and government of the European Union, which focusing uh, this roadmap on six major ambitions, which are a Green Deal for Europe. And the first proposals are coming, and I, I would like to maybe to come back to this because it's uh, absolutely essential. An economy that serves the people, a Europe adapted to the digital era, the protection of our European way of life, a stronger Europe on the international scene, a new momentum for European democracy. We have also this order of rotating presidencies, each member state's having his turn. Now it's Croatia. It will be Germany after Croatia this, in this year. And of course, we have some difficult negotiations ahead of us. One of them is the negotiation with the United Kingdom of our future relation post-Brexit. We have also to renegotiate our budgets for the seven coming years, the budget of the European Union. It will not be easy. Uh, but we have also, as I said, a number of decisions which have been taken which give a clear orientation, I give you the headlines, for the next decade and for a more successful European integration um, in the next decade. One of the many proposals made by our president Emmanuel Macron on Europe, on the, f on the future of Europe, which has been taken over, is to convene a conference uh, on the future of the European Union to, so that in our democracies and in our democratic life at the level of the European Union, those decisions will not be taken alone by the leaders or by governments or even by the European Parliament, which has been elected by the people, by the nations, but also 
with a close association of our citizen. And it's very important because one of the problems we are we have in the European Union, of course, like in all our democracies, by the way, right now, is how to ensure in the digi digital era uh, functioning of our democracy, which gives confidence to our citizens that their voices are he heard, that they, even between elections, that they really take part to the debate. It's something we have learned from previous elections, but also from social movements like in France uh, last year. Um, maybe before we, we go to the, to the debate, some, some remarks on some of these um, big uh, um, challenges and goals which we collectively have assigned to our European Union. And what it means for the transatlantic relation. Um, first, foreign and defense policy. Our president has delivered a very important speech last Friday uh, to the French officers about our vision of our national defense policy and our nuclear deterrence and the nuclear deterrence. We are very ambitious for Europe, but we say that the development of European defense has to be and will be complementary of NATO and will help build, help build a European pillar of NATO and will be consistent and more than consistent with a, a continuing strong alliance with the United States. More than consistent because the US rightly asks the Europeans for doing more for our collective defense. It's exactly what we are doing, increasing our national budgets, but also developing, developing collective instruments at the level of the EU to increase our capacities. A word about the digital revolution and the revolution brought by the development of artificial intelligence. We want to have a true, truly innovative European Union. We want to, uh, and we do it in France with a booming uh, startup um, movement, which is very successful, but we want to do it at the level of the whole of the EU. We want to find the right instruments to frame this development so that the society benefits fully from it, so that we create jobs. We know it will destroy jobs, but we want to have a, a net big creation of jobs and value in our societies. And to frame this development in such a way means a certain type of regulation. But also, I repeat, means empowering our society to go ahead, to create, to give, to give full, to benefit from these new opportunities. This is a balance. This is also the future of our, the model of our society, because these developments, they will have consequences on our democracies. We know that. Europe was, the European Union actually, was the first to find the ways to regulate quite successfully on the protection of privacy. Adopting and implementing a European regulation on the protection of personal data. We have set a sort of a model and we want to build it also with the 
with a conversation with the United States. For instance, on the development of artificial intelligence, we have proposed through our G7 presidency, which France had last year, to create, in the framework of the OECD, a partnership, a global partnership for artificial intelligence and on artificial intelligence. So here again, we want to go forward, even if we have not made always the same choices with the US. But I remark that even in the US, for instance, the question of privacy is more and more discussed. And even in some states, like in California, there are now regulatory uh, regulations in place. And finally, a word on the Green Deal. It's obviously, in terms of transatlantic relations, a more difficult issue because the United States decided to walk out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The European Union wants to go ahead. We have a very important conference which will take place at the end of this year in Glasgow, COP26, about the implementation of the Paris Agreement. It's absolutely necessary considering the real threats represented by the climate change to all our countries all over the world really important to go ahead and to increase the level of ambitions of our national plans against climate change as stipulated in the Paris Climate Agreement. We are convinced that there are plenty of opportunities, in spite of this disagreement with the US on the Paris Climate Agreement, plenty of opportunities to work with the United States also in this field because we have anyway so many things to do. Climate finance, development of agricultural activities, which can be very profitable for the fight against climate change, sustainable transport, energy efficiency, development of new technologies. In many of these fields, we will and we, we can and we will work also together with the US in spite of this disagreement. But we, we will work also, of course, with all other nations, including with those countries such as China and India, who will ro have to play a decisive role in the success of our common strategies against climate change. Finally, and as a conclusion, a preliminary conclusion, since we, we will have a discussion now, my message is very clear. The success of the European integration is and will be the success also of the United States as the other partner of this transatlantic relation. Economically, the internal market of the European Union is already a huge achievement which is beneficial not only to the European businesses but also to American and other companies. We need for our prosperity a prosperous European Union. So on the economic in the economic field, it's obvious for me that the success of the EU is also important for the United States. But I think it's also important for the security of the United States in the future. As I said, we need uh, a strong pillar, European pillar, in this transatlantic relationship. We cannot ask the US to solve all problems all over the, pl the planet without a strong European uh, capacity. And um, if we succeed in what we Europeans, we members of the European Union have started to implement, it will be also a success for the transatlantic relation and for the United States. I thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too long. I hope I was not too short, too brief. But anyway, I am very happy to be with you and I look forward to our discussion now.
you so much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for these uh, preliminary remarks. Um, I had some previous questions, and now I have some new ones as well. Uh -huh. So I want to start with um, with the area that is my favorite area, which is uh, strategic issues, security, and defense, which you, which you did touch upon. Um, one thing that struck me first as a in your speech uh, is how in the end there is almost a conflation between the French policy, the French foreign policy and the French interest and the EU policy, uh, the EU foreign policy and the EU interest. So I kind of want to uh, challenge that a little bit and wonder if when France goes about um, talking about European strategic autonomy, for example, it is a concept that is in the EU global strategy of 2016 and yet we know it's a concept that has been debated since 2016 among European leaders. What exactly do we mean by strategic autonomy? What is the, the goal that we're trying to achieve? Um, how broad is our understanding of strategic autonomy? So I'm wondering um, exactly how, um, how the two messages of both a French vision and a European vision uh, in, in the diplomatic work that you do as, a, as the, the ambassador of France, how uh, in practice you, know, you, you bring them uh, together? That's the first question, and I'm going to join it up with another question, if you don't mind. <laughs> so strategic autonomy is just an example of uh, some, some, something that the French president, for example, will push forward uh, and then you know, try to come together with European counterparts on that. How does that work in practice? So a more practical question. A second question is you referred to uh, President Macron's uh, uh, defense and nuclear deterrence speech last Friday. And he was, uh, he put much more emphasis in his speech on the European dimension uh, of the French nuclear deterrent than previous presidents had already alluded to it without being as clear as to how, um, uh, how central that European dimension of the French nuclear deterrent is to France's vital interests. So I'm wondering, what, do you, what is your understanding uh, of um, that, dimen that European dimension of, of uh, French uh, deterrence? And uh, do you think that it's something that comes from France or that comes from on, on the part of European counterparts asking France to be there uh, uh, as a, as a as a nuclear, not umbrella, but as a, as a um, stronger nuclear power with, a, with that European dimension? Where does that come from? These are maybe two tricky questions to start with. <laughs> very tricky, but also very interesting. <laughs> Sorry, and thank you. <laughs> On the first one, um, the real issue is whether the European Union, for me, and I don't, I, there, 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 there have been many discussions. Uh, you, you seem to, 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 to ask, uh, even to doubt, there, there could be um, um, a, a, a unique or unified uh, European vision on this. And you are, part, you are partly right. There, 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 there are many conversations, of course, because we, go, we, we start from very different positions. Mm -hmm. Our history in France is not the same. And, as uh, you, you have neutral countries, countries right. for which, uh, before coming to your second question, uh, nuclear weapons are completely excluded. You have all also uh, our, our most important partner, Germany, uh, where they have their own history, uh, recent history, and they have to, and they do take this into account that it's completely normal. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the, they do it, uh, I would say, very well. Uh, I mean, the way that Germany has uh, um, now looked at its own history, but it has consequences on the military, for instance, uh, field. So this, there is this uh, set of nations with their different backgrounds, their different uh, policies. And in the field of defense, like in the, all, any other field, the, the secret of the European Union, and it's, it's, a, it's something really unique in the history, is that we succeed from very different perspectives to get to a common decision and a common policy. It is not easy in defense, but it is possible, and we show it. We have started for the first time to spend 
EU money for defence, which was completely impossible two years ago. We have created this European Defence Fund to add more money to the build-up of our defence capacities, which we had neglected for years. Mm. On the top of the increase, recent increase in our de national defence budgets. We have uh, implemented the so-called reinforced structural cooperation, which is something very concrete. We, we are building up um, very concrete cooperations with the different sets of pe uh, countries inside the EU to develop common, uh, for instance, communications um, uh, capacities or uh, to train together our troops. Or every, every of those, there are dozens of new, uh, new, new um, um, uh, cooperations in the field of defense through this uh, reinforced cooperation. Things are moving. And when we, we th this, uh, this, uh, these concepts we, we are putting forward, finally, and uh, the, the bottom line is really that the European Union must be able to act as such. Uh, and of course, with this close partnership uh, with the United States and uh, as a com in a way which is complementary to NATO for uh, uh, defending our values, our interests, it can well happen, we know it, in, especially in our neighborhood, that we would have conflicts where the US would not like to be engaged, to be committed to act and uh, would expect for them itself from, from the Europeans to do, to do the job themselves. We are very uh, happy in Sahel, for instance, right now. France has the leadership of an, in an operation against very, very active, dangerous terrorist movements, which aim at destroying the, the, nation, the states of, of those, the region and create new, terri new, uh, new terrorist territories in the heart of West Africa. We, we, we have the leadership, but, but we know we need the capacities, some capacities for the Americans. And we are telling them right now, because the US, which is completely uh, normal, says, well, look, we have our own pri strategic priorities. We look at how we could, the best possible way, use these capacities for the priorities we have defined. And we ask them to, to keep their support and they recognize we have at least the leadership with the, our soldiers on the ground. And we, I don't know whether they can maintain it, but it shows that we, there are some capacities we, we don't have and we, we should develop them. This is what, uh, where I see the, the uh, consensus, not only among the Europeans, but even with the United States. Mm. And to come to your second question, well, uh, um, this is a n not a new discussion, you have said it. Uh, it's, it is a renewed discussion because um, the question of nuclear um, weapons is, is more, maybe you are the sp more specialist than I am, but maybe more um, on the front uh, uh, line now because we had a development, uh, a negative development of security arrangements. We have, uh, which uh, are not kept, uh, treaties which uh, disappear. But we have also some powers announcing new weapons. So this question comes again to the forefront. But to answer clearly your question, where, whether this discussion comes from France or, or from other European countries, well, there is, for instance, and when I was in Germany, it was already the case, but recently there were some German uh, politicians who, who, who put forward uh, ideas about this. No, no, they didn't propose anything precise, and they did not uh, also express a, a definitive view. But the, the subject was, was mentioned. And from our perspective, from the perspective of a, a French president who is the, the commander-in-chief of our armies and who has to define in the most uh, difficult mo possible moments which could come in the future what are the vital interests of France, which are the base of uh, 
the minimal uh, deterrence we, we, we keep for to obviously now uh, the, our integration with the European, other European countries uh, has reached such a, such a level. And in, in a world which is uh, itself uh, closer and closer, where the challenges are more and more uh, common, we, we cannot not say that uh, there is this European dimension. But it doesn't say anything on the way it would be implemented for two reasons. First, because we absolutely don't know what could happen in the future, and also <laughs> because this deterrence uh, has its value because there is the uncertainty on the way how it will be used. If there is one, one day, I wish it is not the case, of course, but if there is one day an enemy, then he, he must not be able to know what we would do. So this is the idea, the, the idea of deterrence. This is the, the concept of deterrence. So the, we, 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 we have just said this. It, it, there is nothing really or completely uh, new in the idea of uh, this vital interest, nuclear deterrence. The president, our president just updated our doctrine mm -hmm. in this very important speech and recognized maybe, as you said, more uh, explicitly than his predecessors, that uh, there is this uh, European dimension in our, what we call, commu des community of destiny. How do you say it? Community of, uh, we, yeah. we, we are, our futures are linked. And um, he proposed, indeed, a dialogue on this to our U European partners. And it's up to them, of course. Um, then, to, because there, there is absolutely no, you, no obligation, of course, but there is this offer. Hmm. Okay, I would like to ask a tiny, tiny question. Well, but maybe that's going to take too long an answer. Um, but maybe in, in just a couple of words, how do you see uh, for the EU a strategy to have European norms uh, prevail in the digital? and innovation domains that you mentioned that are currently, you know, norms are currently being discussed internationally on how um, the digital domain, uh, AI, uh, technological innovation, you know, are being regulated. How can the EU ensure that the norms that it wants to put forward that respect individual freedoms and, and liberties are going to be the ones that are going to be adopted, you know? at the global level? What strategy can the EU adopt to do that? Well, I think the, the best strategy is to, uh, to find the right balance to in, the, in our own regulations. And uh, our regulation on the protection of personal data is a good example because it is for sure not perfect. It is for sure not adapted to all uh, nations in the world or even to all other democracies, but at least it, is a, well, it, it was a first legal base, very detailed base, which handles the issue of how we can protect the privacy in the digital age. And this is the best way to project and to influence the standards worldwide or of others. And it is the reason why this regulation is actually being looked at even in the US or in other places mm. as something very interesting to look at if, we, if, if one day you want to regulate. And I think that it's the best way for the EU to, to have an influence, to mm. continue to find early enough the right regulations um, in this issue. But we want to do it in a partnership with other democracies and, as I said, in particular with the United States, of course, as much as we can. Interesting. Okay. I'm sure there is plenty of questions, so I'm going to now open the floor. Uh, if you can raise your hand and uh, wait for the mic and introduce yourself. Please. Uh, so uh, it's my understanding that for any Green Deal or efforts to address climate change and carbon mitigation in France, there's going to be an element of uh, climate equity. 
Um, so was, that is to share the costs and the opportunities of any efforts in a fair manner and mm. across the society. So could you comment on any of the lessons that you've drawn from the Yellow Vest movement and what kind of plans you have to address that going forward? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a really important one. And as you said rightly, it was the lesson we learned also for, from the Yellow Vest movement. The same people in our societies will rarely protest when uh, there is a rise in the price of gas because they depend on their cars to go to the job or to the hospital or and it is normal that they they find themselves very much disadvantaged and the same people will for their children grandchildren be afraid of the climate change and the catastrophic consequences it will have on on the on the daily life of their generation and the future generations so the the real the only possibility is to to have a, a determined transition climate and energy transition but to add as you said the word fair which means it must be the the <coughs> The, the price to be paid and the benefits to be reaped from this uh, policy <coughs> must be fairly distributed, taking into account the different constraints of different groups in the society. And in that case, for instance, the fact that, uh, and it was maybe a mistake, but anyway, it must be fixed. In some regions, the public services have been closed and people depend more on, uh, on their own transport, personal transport, to go to reach those public transports in other towns. All this goes together. So this, our societies must uh, really devise a strategy and policies so that the transition does happen uh, with the... Um, uh, the goal of uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, which means very concrete goals. For instance, no more uh, combustion motors vehicles by 2040. Electromobility developing very, very fast. Uh, but we, 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 we must secure a very efficient policy in this direction. At the same time, a fair distribution of benefits and uh, constraints it involves. And what is, this is for in, internally in each of our countries, but it is also true at the level of the European Union. Because in the European Union, some countries like Poland uh, depend very much on coal. So we, we have, of course, to take into account that their transition will be uh, more difficult. Although it's difficult in all countries, it's difficult in Germany, even in France, we, have, we had still uh, coal-fired thermal plants, even after having closed our last coal mines. And we have decided to close our last coal-fired thermal plants by 2022. But everybody has sacrifices to, to or has uh, efforts to make but it is a reality that some member states of the eu have more efforts to do and it, it also, also this must be uh, uh, taken into account in a fair way so there are mm. two two ideas of fairness or two levels of fairness if you need. okay thank you yes please Hi, merci beaucoup. Um, I just wanted to ask, so I'm, I come from Greece and I'm curious to know how do you see the future relationship between the EU and the Western Balkans given that countries such as your own and the Netherlands vetoed the accession talks for North Macedonia and Albania? We have recognized the great efforts made by Greece and Northern Macedonia with the PRESPA agreements. We, they have solved uh, the issue, the issue of the name, so-called name issue, which had been unresolved for uh, many, many years. And it is very important strategically for the, um, for, the, for the future of the whole region. And we encourage other countries of the region of Western Balkans to also, um, well, 
as Germany and France have made after second after World War II, to 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 take the uh, the road of reconciliation and common uh, construction construction of a common space. For instance, Serbia and Kosovo, which is very difficult, but we 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 encourage them. At the same time. We continue to, to say that we, we have recognized for years, we have been recognizing for years what you call the European calling vocation of those countries, which means that the fact that they should one, one, one day jo join the European Union, become members of the European Union. But this process, this enlargement policy, is not a sort of uh, instrument of a foreign policy. Enlargement policy is a policy as such, which has to do with the European Union as such. It must be uh, understood that we want, also for the future new members, we want the success of the European Union. So the success of the European Union in the future, it is also the success of the enlargement and the accession of new members. And it is not, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a long uh, and delicate process to have new members in this European Union. So we have to draw lessons from the enlargement policy as it has been conducted in the recent enlargements and in the recent years. And what we asked as France was to review this enlargement policy. And the new European Commission just came forward with proposals which we think are, are really uh, going in the right direction uh, to review the process. So now we will see um, what, uh, how these um, proposals by the new European Commission on the enlargement policy will be discussed. And we will, um, of course, uh, have to, as member states, now take positions on this. It is clearly one of the priorities of the Croatian presiden presidency during the first half of this year. So we'll see what we will decide uh, first on, the, on this uh, modified or reformed enlargement policy, and then uh, on the consequences we can draw on the enlargement process. Thank you. Over there. Hello, thank you very much for coming. My name is Dennis, I am a student here. Earlier you were discussing norms, and I was wondering if you could speak more to a divergence of norms between the United States and Europe, and how best our norms can be reconciled in moving forward as we approach issues of transatlantic and global concern, particularly with regards towards economics, politics, and particularly technology. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Well, we, we, um, we discussed this already uh, as far as norms on uh, the digital revolution are concerned, of course. We, so we, privacy belongs to this, of course. And we, we, uh, I mentioned the fact that we, we wish to have a, a, a multi-stakeholder conversation on the development of artificial intelligence because we know it's so important both for the economy and for the democracy. So the, the idea of this multi-stakeholder group with science, business, governments of course, but also civil society, would be something where we could discuss together the issues before and in, 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 in a way which would help us to get to norms which we could uh, agree on. This is very important. Uh, the European Commission, the, uh, before the change, uh, before the elections even, has made some proposals also to the United States, to the US administration on industrial uh, um, uh, trade, trade in uh, industrial goods to to uh, to get closer uh, our industries through a new certification processes. So we have made proposals. It is true that some in some domains norms are very sensitive. 
especially in agriculture, it's true. And uh, ev every side, also the US with its own agencies, uh, has uh, its own uh, uh, process in uh, developing its own norms. But um, um, yes, I think we, we have, uh, with, especially in this field of new technologies, uh, we, have to, we have to discuss very much. And by norms, I understand your question as uh, encompassing quite a large uh, scope, which is uh, the ways we will uh, try to, to regulate these new developments of our economy. If I may just interject, um, what about values? Because usually we talk about norms and values together, you know, it's kind of like one set of same things, but I think it's pretty different. I mean, usually values underpin even the, the norms that you will develop in a certain um, economic sector, you know, to regulate a certain type of technology. But values are broader, they're more difficult to grasp, they're there in society. It's often been debated, I mean, for decades, whether America and Europe share common values. Where do you see that going? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's a, it's a basic question, but you, we should not uh, satisfy ourselves with uh, uh, broad and general speeches on values. We must be more specific. Okay. And uh, um, the development of artificial intelligence, what I said uh, about AI is very much about values. Only two words, facial recognition. We are here on the two levels of technology and values. So our health developments, well, development of healthcare, uh, how to use the, the in incredible possibilities we have now. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to, to benefit fully from the, the new technologies we have developed in, bio, in, in the biosciences and to keep certain values we, we find very important. So, um, the two, the two norms and values are very much linked, mm. indeed. Yep, in the back. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask um, if you had any lessons learned or um, things that uh, Francis thought about mitigating uh, after. I think it's good. Uh, any lessons learned or mitigating steps after Brexit? Um, that you might want to um, talk about to keep more states in the European Union. Any thoughts on that? Well, the first lesson we learned uh, through the European elections uh, last May, which I described, is that the people of the other European nations were rather more pro-European after Brexit or in this Brexit uh, period. The second lesson I would uh, draw from what happened is that we must uh, tell the truth to our peoples and solve the problems. It sounds very simple, but it is the best way to avoid uh, situations like the uh, referendum of uh, 20 in 2016, where people were not told the truth and I had the impression that being a member of the EU didn't help solve their problems. So it's uh, very simple to say, it's more difficult to uh, do, but uh, those are basically the, the three lessons I draw from this, and I'm happy to, to get in, into it in more details, of course because it, it concerns migration and asylum policies, economic policies, relations with uh, other countries in the world, and so on, values, uh, many, many, uh, many policy fields are here involved. So you're suggesting that um, so solving the problems uh, that the people in Europe at least feel that they are facing, um, and which could lead them to either vote uh, in a referendum in favor of leaving the EU, or if not given that opportunity, would vote for Eurosceptic parties or na more nationalist 
uh, parties, um, then if you take that, that stance of this is what the problems, the types of problems that we have to solve, what are they? You suggesting migration? Well, the European Green Deal is that. Mm -hmm. fair, a fair European Green Deal. More capacities in defense in a, in a more dangerous world. People need that. Mm. They need jobs. They need uh, security. They need uh, to be reassured um, in relation to what they perceive as threats in the future. Climate change, loss of jobs through because of the uh, technological revolution or because of a lack of uh, capacity of Europe to defend its own interests mm -hmm. towards other countries. It's all of that. Yeah. We have last, a last, last question. question. Last question. All right. Thank you, Benjamin. Is there right here? You've had your chance already. Thank you very much. You talked a lot about cooperation with America, and I think that's very important. I just wanted to ask, um, for instance, now with uh, the Secretary of Energy announcing a, a coal first initiative, reinvesting in coal. Do you think that in these kinds of fields there are means of putting pressure on the government here or would that not help at all? Especially with America also getting more invested in European energy politics? Well, every, every country makes its choices, so... Uh, uh, there, there, but, but the problem is global, exactly. The problem is global. The climate change is a global challenge. And, uh, so, um, um, but there is also the economic, the economic dimension, of course. So, um, I have not read this, uh, these statements, uh, and I, I don't know exactly what, uh, what it practically means, but uh, um, I think it's very important that the EU stands on its policy, especially in the run-up to the Glasgow COP26. And uh, that more and more, um, nations, more and more countries um, converge uh, in a practical way, not only uh, as a general uh, orientation, uh, towards the uh, goal of carbon neutrality in 2050. This must be uh, really the, the goal. How do you get to this, of course, belongs to each country. It is a secret of the success of the Paris conference in 2015. It was a, not a top-down approach, but a bottom-up with a, a nationally determined uh, plans. Uh, and uh, we can only succeed with each country bringing its own uh, uh, decisions, but with uh, a determined effort to reduce uh, emissions and to succeed both uh, in mitigation and in adaptation efforts and to reach uh, this uh, neutrality, uh, carbon neutrality goal. There is no other way. So it's up to every country to, to take positions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.